Okay, so I'd like to welcome everybody to another edition of Quantum Computation in Isolation. Um, so today I'm very happy to introduce um, Dr. Jared McLean. Uh, Dr. McLean got his bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of California, Berkeley in 2010, his MA in physics uh, from Harvard in 2015, and his PhD in chemical physics from Harvard in 2015 under Professor Asperu Kuzik. He was in a postdoc fellow at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, starting in 2015, and currently he's a research scientist in the Google Artificial Intelligence uh, Lab. He's recipient of many awards, including the Robert Karplus Prize in Chemical Physics in 2011, uh, the Department of Energy Computational Grant Science Fellowship in 2011, and the Luis W. O. Alvarez Postdoctoral Fellowship in Computing Sciences. And today he'll be talking about the physical simulation through a quantum computational lens. So please help me in welcoming you by muting yourselves and clapping or by clapping virtually of the Jared McLean. Great, thanks so much for the, the wonderful introduction and invitation to talk at this seminar. So I hope to give kind of a, an interesting talk with uh, a few speculative and maybe controversial statements that I hope spark uh, discussion, if not now, then amongst people later or with myself. Um, I find maybe it's best to always leave people with at least a few more questions than you, you answer. And I think this, is, this talk is gonna be kind of a cross between some of the work that I've done in the distant past on simulation and the more recent realizations that I've had due to some, some work based more recently on learning in quantum computation. And, and as I started to think about the more, I realized that maybe some of these results were applicable beyond even just the, the context in which we applied them. And they might be a good perspective for viewing things like chemistry or physical simulation overall. And I hope to share some of that perspective with all of you. And I hope that you find it illuminating as well. So uh, as you probably know, if you're following a, a, a seminar series like quantum computing uh, in isolation, that the quantum timeline has been an interesting one recently. Um, if you kind of look as a function of time, uh, you can see people getting more and more excited about quantum computing. And there's been, this has perhaps happened a few times, say in 1994 when Shor's factoring algorithm came out. Uh, and, you know, we scared a lot of three-letter agencies and people got very excited and jumping forward and kind of thinking about uh, ways to build quantum computers. And then they got a look, people realized that perhaps they're a little bit harder to build than we might've hoped. And there was a, maybe a little bit of a lull. And then as technology and theory and things developed in concert, we made a kind of sudden, a lot of sudden breakthroughs where things started to seem less impossible and more like they were really, really hard. Um, and this kind of current era culminated in maybe not culminated, it's not the right word because the hype continues to, to grow. Um, but in some of these beyond classical or quantum supremacy experiments by the Google group, which was experimental evidence um, that there are some tasks that are much, much uh, harder for a classical computer to do than a quantum one. And that there's not some crazy physical phenomenon that fails you at 50 qubits where this is no longer true. But now we're kind of in this regime, which is this era of noisy qubits where we're kind of uh, still quite a ways away from the thing we need, which is error correction. And there's this giant gap in the middle of asking, well, are there any practical applications we can do in the middle? And what are the most valuable ones, if so, in terms of adding to scientific value or adding to other values uh, for humanity? And so the application areas that people like to talk a lot about um, are often optimization. So this kind of harkens back to the quantum annealing experiments of D-Wave and things like this. Um, machine learning is maybe a little bit more uh, recent one and people are interested in different ways of understanding the quantum wave function as say a probability distribution or generalization thereof. And of course there's the original, which is quantum simulation. That if I have a highly controllable quantum device and I can make it look enough like a device that I'm interested in, then I can answer some novel questions. And here we have uh, what we suspect are kind of strong exponential speed ups. So what is simulation? And I kind of gonna start broad and then kind of dive down into a concept that comes a little bit more from computer science than it does from our maybe normal intuition. Um, and simulation is of course an old idea, even analog simulation dates back to the, the ancient Greeks with these anti-Kythera mechanisms, at which we believe were kind of these analog models of the solar system where we could uh, conjecture that this might be what's causing say planetary motion and kind of simulate by just moving forward. And it was in this similar vein that 
we said, well, instead of planets, what if we had these quantum particles, then wouldn't it be more natural to say, control one quantum system to look like another one? And here I've kind of depicted uh, in a crude way, marionette puppeteer strings, where we try to make one system dance enough like another one and ask only the right questions about it. And this is kind of the general idea behind quantum simulation, as many of you know, um, we prepare some quantum wave function, which is like a system that we can tightly control. We evolve, uh, maybe making it look like another system or enough like it that we can do what we'd like, and then measure very specific quantities. Because if we measured every detail of the quantum system, it would of course scale exponentially and we wouldn't be able to see the advantage we're looking for. And then of course, some great advancements happened as we moved from this more uh, this early idea of simulation and kind of merged and hybridized with modern computer science and discrete computation to learn that we could do tasks that don't look a whole lot like quantum simulation. So maybe they look like factoring products of two large primes or solving linear differential equations or linear systems of equations. And we really depended on that abstraction into the qubit in leaning on those ideas from computer science to make that successful. And so just to kind of remind everyone about the quantum computing abstraction that we're using, um, we're going to kind of use qubits, which are these zero and one uh, ket vectors, if you want to call them that, which slightly generalize the idea of a classical bit from zero and one to something kind of in between. And I'm not going to make too much use of them, but these quantum circuit diagrams that we read like music notation from left to right uh, in order to implement the operations that we kind of uh, digitally expect on a quantum computer. And that's not to say there aren't other forms of quantum computation, but it's the one I'll be thinking uh, the most about. So one of the big applications you've probably heard about if you've read any of these articles that come out recently on quantum computing is the simulation of chemistry. Um, and so I think it's good to remind ourselves what we mean by simulating chemistry. And this often implies something like if I gave you some loose idea of a molecular structure or a lattice, or just like a guess or something that came from X-ray diffraction, from just that information, I'd like to use my computer to gain a better understanding of that system. And it might mean how it absorbs light, how it complexes with other species, or perhaps how it interacts with different uh, metal surfaces. And then of course, the second part that's sometimes implicit is we'd usually like to leverage that understanding to go to a control or design phase. If I knew exactly why a system absorbs light and have that understanding, it's easier for me to design better photovoltaics. If I know which systems complex with each other, perhaps I can prevent misfoldings of proteins. And if I know why systems complex with certain species, maybe I can start to uh, design better catalysts and get platinum and other expensive or irreplaceable metals out of catalytic converters. And of course, this sounds like a grand dream. Um, and the other tantalizing part about electronic structure and simulation of chemistry in particular, is it seems like there's almost a solution afoot. So uh, a famous quote by Paul Dirac was that the underlying physical laws necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are thus completely known. And the difficulty is only that the exact application of these laws lead to equations much too complicated to be soluble. And what it's kind of referring to in a way is this uh, cartoonish depiction at the top where I could sort of digitally encode something like a benzene ring, uh, cram it into this uh, linear eigenvalue problem, and then be able to get out a lot of that understanding that I had from the slide before. Um, and this is kind of a nod to the fact that for the physics we're interested in at the level of chemistry, most of the terms in the Hamiltonian are known. It's not like some very hard problem. It's just a map of like determining, say, the strong force or things like this. Um, we can just kind of proceed forward. And so you might be looking at this and saying, oh, well, if you haven't spent a lot of time working on this, it's just a linear eigenvalue problem. Why do we need a whole field to work on this. Um, and it's interesting a connection because the challenge of chemistry is deeply related to the power of quantum computing. That is, it naturally lives in a state space which is explored by the quantum computer. So the problem of kind of determining these chemical properties that I mentioned is one where you kind of slice up space because everything has to be discrete on a computer and you decide where you're going to allow the electrons to sit. And if you have sort of this orbital picture or you could set up a grid or something like this, and there are M places to put a single electron, the dimension of that eigenvalue problem is just M. Um, but then if you start to add more particles and we ignore anti-symmetry just for simplicity, 
Um, as soon as I have two, the, the number of places I could put that or the dimension of the problem is roughly m squared. And you can see that this kind of rapidly blows up until I, even if I have a coarse discretization and uh, of a pretty small molecule, then the dimension of this problem grows to something like 10 to the 160. So that's obviously a problem to give you some feeling for this number, the particles in the known universe, according to Wikipedia, is something like 10 to the 80. So this kind of means that every uh, particle in the universe has a universe within it, uh, and you need to enumerate each one of the particles in those. So that's obviously a wildly intractable thing to do. Um, there are, of course, approximation methods which don't do this directly, but the power of the quantum computer is that it naturally lives in this space, does all the physics correctly, and then you get to ask it not about the 10 to the 160 coefficients, but only about the pieces of information that you care about, like energies, or did this reaction happen, or something like that. And that's kind of the power of quantum computing as well. We, of course, grow even in these abstract algorithms like Shor's to the whole space, but eventually we demand a kind of collapse into a few answers that we are in fact interested in. So let's think a little more broadly about what simulation means in this context. So if we kind of lean on these results from uh, quantum computer science and what it really means to simulate something, we'll find that we've gotten better and better in the literature as regards to algorithms of this problem of given a system, which defines a Hamiltonian, the thing that it is actually most natural at is evolving that system forward in time. And so we sit there and we can propagate it forward and we can do this very, very well. And this is a rapidly developing field where numerically exact evolutions can often happen times sublinear in the number of basis functions, as opposed to say, uh, exponential in the classical case or exponential in the particle number. And the exact classical computation hits a strong exponential wall because uh, entanglement truncation is challenging, um, but even a quantum computer has limits. So the say no fast forwarding theorem uh, tells you something to the effect that under some assumptions like bounded memory and things like this, the, the simulation time is strictly greater than the physical time of whatever process you're looking at. So if this was all you did, you set up like a single instance of a reaction and just waited on it, um, we know that some chemical reactions take on the order of months to have an appreciable uh, creation like rusting or things like that, we would not get very far in simulation. And so the insight that I wanted to share with you is that of course, this isn't how chemists or physicists do simulation in practice. We do things like go to this time independent picture. So now take another look at this and realize this is not simply propagating the Schrodinger equation forward in time. We've changed to realize that uh, we can often make predictions on time scales beyond the experimental one by realizing that these eigenstate structures correspond to this thing that we have observed from our universe, which is that we tend to be in states of relatively low energy on this time scale. We don't need to consider arbitrarily high energy scales, and we use this observation or knowledge or data from our environment to make longer predictions and break direct simulation theorems like this. And this is kind of be a centralizing idea that in fact, the problem of si simulating becomes different when data is available. Um, and so if we think about this a little bit further, there's been some other fun results coming out of quantum computer science on what you might consider the predictive power of free energies. So after you see this last slide and you're like, okay, well, direct simulation is perhaps not what I'd like to do. I'd like to do maybe eigenvalue problems. I'd like to search for transition states. I'd like to use my observations to do a little bit better. And so you say, can all physically interesting questions be answered by some reduced model? Um, for example, does a system ever thermalize? Uh, you might've taken this as an assumption in a, a statistical mechanics class. Does a system have an electronic gap as you grow it in size? Or will molecule X ever form from constituents Y under some like infinite reservoir? Um, and these were recently shown to be uh, undecidable. And so without getting into the details of what that means, there is a nice definition of physical undecidability that I borrowed from a paper of Chris Moore, which is as a system involves in time, there are sudden qualitative changes that cannot be predicted in any way except evolving the system forward in time and seeing if it happens. No answer in finite time will ever indicate if it will happen or not unless it happens, basically. And this kind of has a, a similar feel if you just sort of imagine what happens as you move from say small molecules to amino acids, to proteins, to cells. It seems like there are sudden qualitative changes 
where we couldn't really, it was not easy to predict that that would have happened from some simple number. And so why am I telling you this for the purposes of this talk? It forms an interesting perspective because undecidability can formally be broken by advice in some cases. And what I'm going to argue is that data is a restricted form of advice. It won't let you solve undecidable problems unless it comes from an infinite time computation, but it is going to boost the power of the computations that you can do. So to make this case, I'm going to kind of do it in the quantum machine learning setting. And to get there, we're gonna take a little bit of a roundabout route and move through uh, variational algorithms. So to give you a quick primer, um, variational algorithms take note of this, say, eigenvalue problem that I mentioned before, uh, which is determines many of the, the problems or data that I would like to know about a physical system and realizes that you can rewrite it over a minimization over all uh, of these wave functions. So that nominally is for the ground state, but there's ways to modify it to the excited state. And this is a particularly nice formulation for quantum computers, because as long as you can do some app, uh, action repeatedly, you can make your parameters almost anything. You can cycle through these different functions, evaluate your objective, feedback, and try to approve your answer uh, as much as possible. And this has been applied to a wide variety of domains now. Originally, we did it in chemistry, and then people thought about nuclear physics, optimization, and then eventually machine learning, where I'm going to argue that it still fits, but perhaps fits uh, a little bit less well, but will still be an interesting lens through which to view these problems. So just to give you an example, if you haven't seen too many of these before, um, one of these networks in hardware, so at the left, we just have two transmon qubits at the top. At the bottom, we have one of these quantum circuit diagrams I mentioned that you read from left to right like software. And each time you hit one of these gates or operations on the qubits, it corresponds to some action being done on the hardware. And we have a single parameterized object in the middle that after we measure, we do some sort of adjustment on it. And this you know, might vaguely remind you of something like a, a neural network where we're tuning biases and weights, but I'll get back to that in a moment. And so of course, this experiment that I'm showing here is a bit of a, a, an oldie, but a goodie because it has very clear uh, things that you can see between the action of the hardware and the, the circuit itself. Um, but we've done some more recent ones and I'll show you in a second why this is kind of interesting from the connection point of view, from simulation to machine learning to computation in general. And so a more recent experiment that we did was this Hartree-Fock experiment. And you can see here that we did this on uh, say 12 qubits. Um, it involved a fairly large number of gates. And of course, if you are familiar, if you're a chemist um, or a physicist who's worked on free fermion models or Hartree-Fock itself, um, you might say, well, isn't that efficient to do classically? And yes, it was. Um, it was kind of an exploration both in getting this primitive to work so that we could work, use it in larger contexts where it's not classically efficient, examining error mitigation, but also because this primitive actually connects very nicely to something else um, that I'm going to talk about. So I want you to kind of just keep it in mind and remember that we have these very efficient circuits for uh, doing this type of free fermion rotation. And I won't get too into the details of the error mitigation, but if you're interested, um, you can check out the paper. So this view that quantum circuits sort of resemble uh, neural networks has been um, now explored in the literature in a number of ways. There's different methods you can use to try to induce nonlinearities. Some people don't worry about this, they just proceed forward as a linear operation. And the point of this is just to kind of say that if you squint at the top and at the bottom, they seem somewhat related. So can we identify uh, some similarities or differences between the two that would be helpful for borrowing technology between one or the other? And this has in fact been a useful analogy, at least so far. Um, we recently identified some problems that have to do with vanishing gradients in quantum circuits. Their actual or origin is a bit different than the traditional vanishing gradient in deep neural networks, but it also serves as an opportunity to point out these kind of fundamental differences in estimation complexity where you have to sample things randomly um, versus not. So what is this connection that I mentioned with the classical uh, computing community? So there is this concept of unitary neural networks. So we know that quantum circuits are unitary. We know that neural networks are usually not. Um, and one of these vanishing gradient problems was 
is in the classical community related to exploding or vanishing gradients as a function of depth. And the thought was that a unitary or orthogonal network does not have a norm that vanishes or explodes with depth. So this might be a good tool to use. And this was explored by um, a number of people. And it's interesting to note um, that basically this goes on as unitary nonlinearity, unitary nonlinearity. And the thinking is, okay, well, unitaries are the natural playing field of quantum computers. So perhaps this is an opportunity to, uh, to help out. And basically it's even more enticing when you open one of these papers and realize that the efficient unitary neural network is in fact exactly that circuit uh, which comes from free fermion rotations. It's just that it's been a little bit unnoticed by the literature. And so, okay, you're in a great situation. You have this object that's already a competitive machine learning method, and you have the ability to not only do the unitaries on your quantum computer, but systematic ways for making them more and more interesting. So this seems like a great opportunity to inject some quantum and do things much better than we could do otherwise, right? Okay, so let's boost the power with quantum computing. Uh, so the classical case takes n inputs and has n outputs. So a natural choice for this, if you're familiar with fermions, it's something like a number operator. If you're not, you can think of this just as kind of the amplitude going in each of n modes uh, on your input. And so now I'm going to track different parts of the circuit we could implement and sort of the effective dimension that we explore here at the bottom. And so as we go through the input, um, we now have an effective dimension n. We do some rotations. Um, I'm now going to inject some particles and I'm going to interact them with arbitrary fermion interact two body interactions. And I'm gonna repeat over and over again, doing some more rotations. And it's not hard to convince yourself that this is actually a universal quantum circuit. And now I'm going to do some more readout. Um, so I'm going to destroy some particles or just kind of measure and renormalize. So what I have at the left is my N inputs. What I have at the right is my N outputs. So it's compatible with this unitary neural network. And in the middle, I explore some crazy high dimensional space with all of the power of quantum computing that no classical computer could match unless B equals DQP. So great, that's fantastic. So what do we do with this? So just before we go on, let's uh, let our model have a little bit of data as a treat. So I'm just gonna call some data XI, YI, uh, and I'm going to encode XI as the sum over basis state. So there's P of them now, which would have been N before so that I can keep you on your toes. Um, and now I'm going to set up my data as the result of this arbitrary length quantum circuit. And if we allow for ancilla qubits, this is actually a pretty general model of computation. And so because this circuit is arbitrarily long, uh, if all I gave you was the inputs xi and the circuit, then you could not give me this result in general unless p is equal to vqp or quantum computers are about as powerful as classical ones. And so this, this is quite a, quite a strong uh, requirement. And so direct simulation is about as hard as the hardest quantum circuit. So now let's write out what the form of this function is that I'm actually going to measure because I gave in uh, P inputs and I compute that. And it kind of takes this form uh, where the details of U are lumped into B. Um, but what I notice is this is a quadratic function with at most P squared coefficients. And it's a hop, skip and a jump away into general learning theory to find out that basically um, with no data, this was an arbitrarily hard quantum circuit and with data, it's an almost trivial learning task. So somehow the presence of data has sort of elevated my classical model to be on par with my, my quantum uh, computer. And this is kind of the example of what we mean of the power of data when we get into it. Um, and of course, this is a bit of a trivial example and we kind of ran into this one organically. It's because of the form of the encoding that we use. And so this begged the question, okay, can we actually develop a framework for understanding when this happens? There's been a lot of assumption that having a quantum circuit, which is hard to simulate, is enough to endow you with this power. But when data is available, there's actually a new adversary in town. It can lift data from that quantum computer or from nature, can lift your classical models to compete with you. And so we kind of formalize this in the paper into a different complexity class, this BPP SAMP. Um, which recognizes that if you can take data from nature and view it as a quantum computer, this can in fact elevate classical algorithms into this higher ability to solve problems that you could not solve uh, before. And this is uh, something that's very important to think about 
if you're planning for the future of say quantum machine learning or even quantum simulation, where if you're simulating a system and some data is available, it's not enough to ask what one can do in the total abstention of data. So what we try work to build um, was both a theoretical framework and a system for practically testing very quickly whether certain methods that if you pursued them in this way could yield something like uh, a quantum advantage for you. And so I'm just going to go over part of this kind of flow chart, but basically uh, we're going to center in on things like testing the geometry or specifically the function label to understand and make quick tests and determinations of what can actually be done um, in many of these circumstances. So in order to do that, I'm gonna to have to introduce kernel methods just a little bit um, and specifically uh, quantum ones, but I don't want to belabor that too much. So I think I maybe discounted kernel methods a little too much in the past before I learned more about them. Um, but basically the gist of it is we wanna take advantage of methods that have been developed classically that only use as input some kind of pairwise proxy for similarity or the geometry, which is the kernel. And if we obtain that thing from a quantum computer, hopefully we can express geometries that are both powerful and interesting that are not easy to express on the classical side. And methods that might be an example of this are things like support vector machines, regressions, et cetera. And what does a kernel actually buy you? Um, well, it turns out that kernels, when you can use some relatively simple similarity metrics, imply a mapping into a linear space where you do the problem, but that mapping can be crazy high dimensional, infinite dimensional, things that if you were actually working in that space, it would be very unclear how to manipulate. And that's kind of some of the power of these methods. And to bring it back to quantum uh, for just a second, one could choose some quadratic quantum kernel, which on the face of it seems to have the properties of a kernel you'd like, like positive semi-definiteness. Um, and you can see here what feature map that implies. So it's kind of a sum over the basis states uh, and things like that, this kind of linear quantum kernel. But if you go back to the expression that I had a few slides ago and ask for the value of some interesting observable, you find that it actually misses the cross terms. So if I start trying to do these predictions on these different cross terms, um, then I will actually find that I do not get the right result. And so just to show you how kind of subtle kernel methods are, instead of computing that inner product, I'm going to compute the inner product. And then on my classical computer, square the, uh, the element-wise entries of this matrix that I get back, assuming I have a finite number of points. Um, and that's going to imply a feature map, which does in fact contain all of the cross terms. And so this can learn observables. It has other nice features too, like taking care of the global phase in a way. And this is the quadratic kernel that was mentioned in the, um, or developed in the paper by Havlicek et al, um, that they call the kind of quantum uh, kernel. So now to kind of dive a little bit deeper, uh, we're going to set up a model that we can both um, examine a little bit numerically and also dive a bit deeper and kind of ask questions about um, how, how predictive these tools that we've built are and what are these tools. And so to do that, I'm just going to have some data coming in XI. And I want you to imagine that this is perhaps an initial state. Maybe it defines my Hamiltonian or my physical system, or it could be just kind of more general data that I've accumulated about a system, maybe X-ray spectra, things like this. Now I'm going to use an encoding circuit which encodes this particular data into a quantum state. And you know, this could take many forms. You'll see examples um, in a few slides. Um, and then I'm going to define some kind of dividing surface. And this basically is what determines my function. As I mentioned before, if you allow for ancilla qubits um, and kind of these general maps on top of those, this in fact includes arbitrary computation. So it's not a very restricted model. It's just written in a quantum form that makes it more familiar. And so this might include things like magnetization or transition probability, or like a reaction dividing surface or image classification. And I'm going to characterize my data as this kind of XI and YI throughout. And you can immediately make some fun observations like that the quadratic quantum kernel, for example, is invariant to the quantum uh, neural network or dividing surface. So that's kind of fun. And with enough data, this is equivalent to an infinite depth quantum neural network. That's kind of interesting if you're steeped in it, but um, it's not so important for, for moving on. But one thing that will be important is if you noticed before, 
uh, we sort of defined this quadratic quantum kernel and this kernel based on the inner product between two states. Uh, and so this uses something like the quantum state fidelity as a metric, um, which can be a little bit problematic. Uh, so if you take only a few qubits, you might not notice it, but as you go to larger and larger numbers of qubits or states, um, you start to have these phenomenon that are sometimes known as overlap catastrophes. I think even Walter Cohn referenced them in his Nobel speech for the reason why density functional theory methods would need to take over for wave function methods at some point. And basically, if you use something like an overlap, you could imagine that you had a computational basis state of all zeros. Um, and the fidelity, of course, or overlap with the other all zero state is, of course, one. You flip a single qubit. Uh, so there's some one somewhere. And it says it's now zero. So they're sort of maximally far apart. You flip two, it's still zero. You flip three, it's still zero. So it kind of forces everything to be about as far apart as it can. And it makes training very, very hard. Um, and so what we kind of advocate for, and there are different ways to do this, is things like local successive fidelity approximation. So proxies that eventually have the power to give you the same answers as things like fidelity, but work through metrics that more smoothly define a definition of distance, like a natural proxy for Hamming distance and things like this, but generalized into the quantum case. So that way you can push yourself back towards the spike and get more signal on more parts of the space. And so for that reason, we introduced with something we called the projected quantum kernel. Um, so if the quadratic quantum kernel is this one that depends on the squared elements of these overlaps, um, it's really easy, as I said, to accidentally end up with memorization. So as soon as you have very large states, um, as they differ even a little bit, they start to, to any finite precision, look like they have zero overlap, and you end up with something like the identity matrix, which is only capable of doing memorization. And said, so instead, we wanted to work with local surrogates. Um, so things like the reduced density matrix, which don't worry too much about the notation if you don't like it, you simply take uh, one of your qubits and you ignore the rest and measure the kind of density matrix of one of those qubits and then do it for each of them to get some representation. This is an example that we, we used. And then we use a little bit of uh, knowledge from the classical kernel learning community, which is that if you take exponentials of quantities like this, it becomes sufficient to learn arbitrary functions, assuming you adjust gamma and have enough data of the one RDMs. And this kind of leaves a tantalizing open question of, uh, since we have all these results in physics and in chemistry about how for certain systems, the reduced density matrices or even the density can be universal, which is somewhat surprising given the additional uh, uh, degrees of freedom in the wave function, this could in fact be quite a powerful onsets to use. And in the appendix, we connect this to some things where you can actually sample from all the orders of the reduced density matrices at once in sort of optimal ways using classical shadows. But basically we've taken two steps here. One is to project back into classical space under these reduced density matrices so that we can have a more natural notion of distance between our states. And the second is we've used this nonlinear kernel trick to widely increase the, the sort of functions that we're allowed to express on them. And so what are we going to do? We're going to start introducing some data to understand how this changes the problem. And to do that, we're gonna lean on our kind of central prediction error result. And the prediction error, so of course, I'm not interested on the training data that I'm being given, but rather the how well I predict in the general distribution. And that is to say, I have some basically data distribution that I draw from, a model that I'm going to learn, which will be my kernel model, uh, a true function that I will uh, be accessing through either kind of different training examples or otherwise. Um, this N is the number of training samples, and this S is going to be a central quantity, which I'll sort of intuitively define. And we notice already that the number of training examples appears in here. So if in fact the gap between a quantum and classical method is not too large, then a sufficient number of training examples might always be able to elevate me to remove this gap, basically. And so intuitively, if f of x1 is close to f of x2, so their function values are close, when my similarity measure is large, so I did a good job designing a kernel, then sk is small, and so that's good. Um, and it's actually defined up to regularization um, with some details by this quantity, which is easy to compute once you have your data and your predictions. And so we wanted to be able to say something, at least as a quick and easy test for understanding even opportunity 
for a quantum separation in these cases. So if we massage a little bit uh, this general bound that I wrote down before, we can realize and pull out something that is very intuitive to think about. So it's a geometric difference, which is easy to compute from these kernel matrices, K1 and K2. So these could be any two kernel methods that you tried, quantum or classical. And this is a one-sided difference such that, for example, if I plugged in a classical kernel, KC, and a quantum kernel and evaluated each of these metrics, and these could be projected, these could be the original quantum quadratic kernel, um, then I see that this SC is less than this geometric quantity squared times this. So what does this mean? It means that once I write down this kernel, uh, if this GCQ is small, then no label function associated with this exists where quantum outperforms classical for this particular case. And if this GCQ is large, this means there is some label function for this geometry. It might not have been the one my data came with, but at least that quantum has the edge. And actually there's a simple method that once you've chosen your embeddings, um, you can use it to find this maximal separating uh, uh, function efficiently. So let's just take a minute to, to think about what we said here. So what I'm claiming is not that finding these GCQs proves for all classical or all quantum or something like this. What it is, is an effective method for seeing if you should go forward. Um, say you've chosen some embedding circuit, you've chosen some kernel, you write that down. And now very quickly, you can check, say four or five popular classical methods, like a squared exponential with a few different hyperparameters. And if your studies are anything like ours, a lot of them are going to come out with a G that's kind of like one or two. So that doesn't mean, um, you know, there doesn't exist a quantum method, which is better. But once you have that classical method, which is sort of on par with the quantum one for all possible label functions, why would you ever use the quantum one, basically? So it's a simple screening method for allowing you to develop your embeddings in a way that's uh, effective, and you can at least sanity check against the most popular methods that you're not going to be wildly outperformed immediately. So in order to kind of see how predictive this is in practice, um, we're going to move, I guess, to some examples. And to do this, uh, we need a data source from somewhere. So we can use something like Fashion MNIST, and we can dump that into PCA, um, maybe factor out n components into a, a length n vector. And then we're going to call this each xi. And so basically, we're going to use n qubits for each of these uh, n pieces, or n qubits, one for each piece of data. And in the classical case, we can just feed these in as different parts of the vector. And of course, as we mentioned, the embedding is a crucial part of this. We're going to have an embedding, and each one's going to have an associated geometric factor that tells us how quantum it might or might not be. And without going into too many of the details, we're going to use kind of a hierarchy of them, like uh, a basically classically separable kernel, one which uses IQP circuits, which are a little more quantum, but still easy to get expectation values from, and one which is a very long uh, kind of Heisenberg evolution that we torture to make it um, very, very quantum in a way that's maybe not physical, but serves the purposes of what we're looking for. And then of course, each one of these will have some kind of label associated with it that we actually want to be able to predict. So C is kind of the original classical MNIST labels. Q is some quantum observable also defined by a Heisenberg model. And note that I've said this is a little stilted and one might call it a lot stilted uh, because these embeddings do actually uh, contain since the, the functions themselves, if you remember their definition contain the embedding. So the embedding itself kind of gives quantum the, a leg up in the situation. And finally, we're going to do one that is very stilted which is the labels will be chosen by this eigenvalue problem, saturate GCQ. And so let's kind of uh, see what happens when we look at these uh, data examples. Uh, and I should mention that the classical competition you're about to see comes from a wide variety of methods. So that includes Gaussian and linear SVMs, Ada boost, neural networks, random forest, gradient boosting, all with tuned hyperparameters. Everything will be um, validation or will be prediction error that we get from kind of a validation set um, rather than kind of training error because the training errors we can fit almost arbitrarily when the method is good. So the first thing we wanna look at is this geometric difference that I told you about. Just as a reminder, the, the bottom is the amount of data that I'm including and through that in the quantum methods is a number of qubits. And the Q is this original quadratic quantum kernel. 
And this PQ is the projected one where I reduce things down first and then take kind of a nonlinear function. And what you see is a few interesting things. So remember when the geometric difference is about one, that means that we have a classical method that will always do the same or better than whatever embedding that we've chosen for these systems on any label function that we have. And so what we see is a few interesting things. Um, the quantum one, the Q, which depends on the fidelity, initially does better for some embeddings, but because of these overlap problems for uh, a lot of cases, that performance quickly degrades to minimization, or to memorization, I should say, um, whereas the projected quantum kernel seems to survive a, a little bit longer. And this is because of this effect that even on a classical computer where I can evaluate, say, eight digits of precision without it being a problem, you very often have embeddings as you try to make them better um, that vanish these overlaps. And so now is this predictive of performance. So now we're going to go look at these prediction errors. Um, so on all of these uh, charts, lower is better. And let's start in the bottom right corner over here with the classical data set. And of course, what you see is that this Q1 or this E1, which was basically a mean field or classical rotation, manages to stay on par with the classical machine learning, but the classical does substantially better. And so now let's, uh, let's move on to slightly more quantum and definitely stilted in favor of quantum. So that's kind of in the upper left, this QE1. Uh, now it's a classically separable uh, embedding, but one in which I've supplied the label to everyone. And basically the, the classical machine learning keeps up despite not having this extra edge. And now the, the surprises are uh, even further amplified in the, the one just to the right of it. So these are these kind of IQP circuit embeddings where the, despite having a substantial edge, so it gets the embedding into the function value and the embedding. So quantum has everything in favor of it. Um, and the classical has no knowledge of just, just the original XI. And the power of data shows you that even with this number of data points that I've given it, the classical is keeping up. And this is kind of the, the concerning part that you know when you compete classical versus quantum and you have data, you really need to be uh, paying attention. And so then we go to our bottom left, which is we try even harder to make this data quantum mechanical. And this helps a little bit. Um, and now we see at least some form of separation on this very stilted, very quantum data set, but the classical method isn't doing so bad. It's kind of um, doing about as well as the, the original quantum kernel with the projected one performing better. So not to be deterred, we wanted to know, well, we had this very kind of quantum embedding. What if we use the label function that maximizes the separations? So that's what we did next. So we tipped the scales even further and starting on the left, so the, each one of these is a different embedding. Um, and each one of these has, of course, a different G factor. So the embedding itself tells you that. And we use the label function that saturates this G. So at the far left, of course, we have this classical rotation. And in this case, uh, basically the classical method uh, mirrors the quantum ones in every situation, as you might have guessed. And we've done something else important on this slide, which is we varied the amount of data. So you can see that as we move from 100 training points to 600 training points, in all cases, the classification at their prediction accuracy goes up. Um, and in many cases, even moving from 100 to 600, you can just see how much it goes up is also indicative of the strength of adding even additional data here. And then as we move from to G2, we see moderate, but I'm going to focus in perhaps on the, the right side of this plot. Um, which shows you that for this case where we had a very quantum embedding, um, where we did Heisenberg evolutions with large time scales and we went all the way up to 30 qubits, um, we finally, at least in this situation, see that the projected quantum kernel maintains a sizable advantage over the other ones. So we've kind of tipped the scales in every possible way, but I think this is a demonstration of both the power of data and how hard you have to work to get quantum embeddings that can in fact surpass very powerful classical machine learning. And you also see that the projection step was necessary because the uh, quantum kernel quickly vanishes as the overlap of these states start to drift when you move from like the four or five qubit regime up to the 20 or 30 qubit regime. Um, and this was sort of an important uh, realization for us as well. Um, and it was important enough for us that we, um, you know, we needed this technology, which, uh, is developed in 
key part, the lead engineer, Michael Broughton, is TensorFlow Quantum. And as you saw, we did tons of classical methods. We did tons of quantum experiments and we went all the way up to 30 qubits because we wanted to make sure this thing didn't just work for like five or six qubits and then kind of tank down. Um, and this was a serious amount of compute. We reached over a petaflop per second at peak and it was almost an exaflop total of compute. And we wanted to make sure other people could recreate this. So there's uh, tutorial versions of this. If you've liked some of these quantum kernel type methods and you wanna use them to say predict physical systems, you can log on and check them out um, at the TensorFlow uh, quantum tutorial or check out the blog post as to how we went from the more kind of prototype versions to the versions that really scale um, up to larger and larger systems. And so I hope that this kind of uh, perspective apart from just being uh, interesting from the point of view of methods for analyzing quantum kernels, helps people uh, take a look at simulation in maybe a different way. Um, and you can ask, does data from quantum computers lift classical machine learning above its direct uh, simulation competition? What can quantum simulation data do for chemistry? How can we prepare for um, the ability to get data where we need data? What data should we be asking for? Many problems in design, synthesis, and biology feel like, and I haven't made any proof here, uh, but feel like undecidable problems. What can this say about the way data from nature can help us in our solution strategies for these problems? Is the fate of quantum computers largely to provide data for classical machine learning algorithms? Uh, and I think perhaps not. Um, there's been some recent results in the literature that show that even a small number of copies uh, say that you take multiple times from a quantum sensor and store in memory um, can provide exponential query advantages. But how can we use this for chemistry or for physics and practical purposes? I think this is an exciting area to look into because it's a very different advantage than a rote computational advantage. And so I think that's an exciting area. So kind of in summary, uh, and I guess I'm ending a few minutes before the, the 50 minutes are up. Um, we took a look at, you know, what is the traditional definition of uh, quantum simulation and what does that mean, and how actually even the move from the time-dependent Schrodinger equation to the time-independent one as a tool for understanding long time scale predictions and thermodynamics was already an observation made by data in nature. And we learned that some problems don't admit solutions of this form and that one would simply have to look forward in time, but that's not necessarily a bad thing if time has already been on our side through natural systems emerging. We argued that this is actually even a formal computer science uh, separation that can be studied, that the introduction of data from quantum computers raises the power of your simulations in a real way. And hopefully along the way, we saw some practical tools as well, where if you're lurking on these quantum embeddings for kernel methods, there's quick ways to check whether there'd be any difference between your quantum method and a, few, a suite of a few classical ones. And finally, we showed just how hard it is and just how good these classical machine learning methods are um, for us to have to push to the boundary to see where we would actually see separations with classical computers, especially in this situation where data is available. And so with that, I'd just like to acknowledge, of course, the whole Google Quantum AI team, and in particular, Robert Wong, who did um, a lot of the very hard work of proving things. Um, and most of the hard, rigorous things you've seen today are his work. Um, and Michael Broughton, who helped us scale up and really see these advantages. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions with the remaining time. Thanks. OK. So we have some time for questions. See if you can raise your hand or uh, you can just unmute. Hey guys, uh, so just, uh, hi Jared, um, amazing lecture. Thank you for that. That, that was very insightful. Uh, I have a very broad question. It's not too specific. Mm -hmm. um, do you see a world or a future where we can somehow both learn quantum phase transitions, which, you know, Lucan has done some really amazing work, as I'm sure you know, mm -hmm. uh, and then generatively um, create an new phases of matter, quantum phases of matter that haven't been predicted before. Do you see that that's possible from a computational perspective from what you've seen? Yeah, so it's a good question. I think it is, I think there is a future in which this is possible. In fact, I know there's some interesting work 
coming out soon, that's not out yet, about exactly kind of being able to take in data from nature and what kind of measurements allow you to um, almost immediately from the results I've seen have quantum phases of matter pop out, which I think is really wow. cool. Um, creating them in nature, I think is a, an unexplored topic. And one of the reasons I think underexplored, I should say, not unexplored. Um, and the reason I think this is if you look at quantum error correction, um, so a lot of it borrows from things like uh, the theory of topological phases and topological protection. Um, and if you kind of glance at it, you might dismiss it as somewhat more of an engineering topic. But what it really has buried in it is methods for stabilizing exotic states of matter for you know untold amounts of time. And I think that that feature is a little bit underappreciated, especially because it does it only with kind of local measurements and even in some cases like frame updates in your head. And I think it's an amazing tool for what it does. And if nothing else came from quantum computing, like it would be right. interesting on its own. Getting that into new physical systems, I think will be really hard, but I think there's opportunities there. Awesome, thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, any other questions? By the way, is that work that you mentioned that's coming out, will that be coming from Google or is it just, uh, you can't disclose it? And we should just keep an eye out. Um, it will be coming out by the same first author uh, that was on the power of data paper. So Robert and uh, I believe John Preskill will also be on the paper. Uh, Sounds yeah. good. So, yeah. Okay, uh, any other questions? So maybe I also have somewhat broad question. Um, so, I mean, in your talk and the other talks on quantum chemistry, right? I mean, the elephant in the room is DFT. Like DFT is the world course. But what about DFT plus DMT? So, Sorry, you said D DFT plus? D DMFT, dynamical mean field. DMFT, yeah. That mm -hmm. also, isn't this also used a lot in say high level quantum computation, I mean, uh, quantum chemistry? Or is it more just pure DFT as opposed to DFT plus DMFT? Um, so it kind of depends on the problems people are looking at. And of course, you're right that one of the challenges in going to do a demonstration for like a real physical system you're interested in is real physical systems have a lot more structure than say random sampling. And people have been working on approximations and skilled methods that take advantage of those for a very long time. Um, and so DFT is of course very competitive both because it achieves a good level of accuracy for many cases, um, not all, which is the reason there's wave function games in town at all, um, it achieves it for many cases, still gives you things like distribution of charges and you know, other things people like to use to predict chemical reactions and can often scale to very, very large systems. And so I, it's hard to imagine that it would ever go away completely. Um, even with the sublinear type scaling we have, we have other er overheads for error correction. And so things like if you wanted to do DFT on a very extended photovoltaic and you needed a lot of atoms in there, that would be quite hard. So I think what people are looking at is the way in which you can marry the two and there's still opportunities for work to be done here. So like you said, DFT plus DMFT or DM, uh, DFT plus DMET or something some other impurity-based or embedding-based solver where you can kind of isolate out the part where it's okay that like DFT is not perfect, but for a large part of the exterior environment, it doesn't matter. Whereas at some active site, there are strongly correlated electrons and I really need a detailed description. And I think we wanna use the quantum computer only where it's most useful, kind of target in on these areas and hopefully do as best as we can there. Um, and I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to best link something like DFT with something like the quantum device. Um, and also to, to really flesh out exactly the problems that we would wanna use such a device on. Um, but yeah, I guess that's kind of the landscape as I see it. DFT is unlikely to, to go away in the near future. We simply wanna improve and like make everything better as opposed to suggest a total replacement. Uh, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Have you seen any promising work, Jared, uh, in um, high temperature superconductivity and figuring out how to, let's say, use quantum simulation to determine or maybe reverse engineer the mechanisms for high temp SE? 
Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. Some people have looked preliminarily into, I believe it was some work by Microsoft or Matthias Troyer um, and others in trying to cost out like how you could start to approach some of these things. And the worry is of course, um, you know, high temperature superconductivity and superconductivity in general seems to need very long correlation length scales, which right. uh, might mean if you're doing like a simulation that uses a real space unit cell, you need a pretty huge one as compared to other chemical phenomena you might look at first. And some people will say, oh, well, there's some methods where instead you localize energy and then it's less of a big deal, but then you have other complications. And so I would say that people are interested in working on it, but it's not as clear exactly what the minimum viable experiment will be. And this kind of uh, goes back to something I was saying earlier, which is when we say that we can then simulate that phenomenon, we mean that we can literally like step forward in time and take measurements. But right. if we don't know what to look for, that doesn't, that's, we might not see the mechanism that is happening. Like that's the scientist is still has to be involved in some way to create this reduced model, at least until our machines become so autonomous that they can identify things like that too. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like decades where we thought it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Um, so it seems like the most successful case in the simulations was when you had the projected kernel method. Right, and, and that's the one where you were considering the RDMs specifically. And, and so RDMs are, are kind of local observables in some sense, right? Like correlation functions, mm -hmm. energies, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. So is what they're telling you essentially that, and, and this is also for the data where you've sort of made sort of maximally quantum data, yeah. right? Um, so is the, the conclusion then sort of that quantum computing is sort of best for quantum systems then like that's the natural um, type of data that you're going to want to learn on or, or study using these uh, methods, essentially? Yeah, that is, it is definitely the most natural advantages that we're going to have. I, my personal opinion is the evidence to date that it's going to help on entirely classical problems is mostly based on hope, um, whereas the quantum case there are some, I would say, even just recently more compelling examples of even just given a few noisy copies of a quantum system, you can at least do some things that are now provably hard. That was kind of the hard part to do, even for interactive classical protocols. So you can learn things about them. Of course, then you ask, okay, where does your quantum data come from? And I think that that pipeline has not been fleshed out enough. It has to come from some quantum sensor that can transfer it in with Re transducted is sometimes the word that gets used, reasonable fidelity maybe, um, you know, and then perform the operation. And for things like chemistry and physics, you might say, okay, what's the most natural sensors? Things like NMR look like quantum sensing, but they're more ensemble. They're not single instances. Is there some modification that's close? And so it, it looks a little bit sci-fi, but if we had a, a harder use case worked out, it might encourage people to work in that direction. And so I do think you're right that the most natural place for these kind of quantum learning algorithms to happen is on quantum data. And that's probably where if we see successes, it will be in that area. Thanks. Sure. Okay. So thank you everybody for the nice question. So maybe let's thank um, Dr. McLean one more time. Great. Thanks a lot for the invite. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Stay safe, everyone.